Hello and welcome. Thank you once again for joining with me with these reflections. I'm grateful for you taking the time out to watch and listen to these. Last Sunday marked the changing of the seasons. Winter is now officially over and spring is unfolding before us. We know this because the time on a tradition of moving our clocks forward an hour occurred. It's in our calendars. This is when spring happens. We all lose an hour's sleep at this time. However, the reality is that the natural world, natural world around us got the memo of spring arriving a few weeks prior. The daffodils were already in bloom before this Sunday. The birds have been singing their chorus song and making their nests. There's been a flurry of activity from nature all around us all long before Sunday. And so noticing the changes of seasons is important. We adapt to the weather being warmer or colder in various ways. Well, most of us do, don't we? In fact, I have two issues with all of this that gets me a little annoyed. If you could bear with me just for a moment, for I don't know why I get annoyed about such things, because they always happen and I shouldn't be surprised. But let me give you two examples of what I mean. My first annoyance, and maybe you can identify with this, involves our shops. They're always rushing to move us on to the next thing, to think about the next season, to invest in the next festival, even before the season we are in is even halfway through. I don't want to be buying a winter's coat in the middle of June, neither do I want to be thinking about Christmas at the end of August. And none of us really require to be faced with Easter eggs two days after stuffing ourselves with Christmas turkey and pudding. The next matter that gets me a little bit annoyed is those who refuse to admit the summer is well and truly over and persist in wearing shorts and t-shirts even in the middle of winter. I wonder if you have a friend like this. For we all want to say to that friend who persists in wearing summer gear in the middle of December or January, that do they realise they make the rest of us feel cold just by looking at them? So please put a jumper on and jeans on. It makes the rest of us feel a little bit better. Anyway, mini rant is over. In the middle of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament as it is known in Christianity, there is a collection of books known as wisdom literature. Many of these are associated with the royal courts of King Solomon, who was son to King David. And King Solomon himself was known to be wise. He had a reputation for it. And two of the books in this selection of wisdom literature is Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. They were written by a parent who wanted to pass on to the next generation reflections on life, the nuggets of wisdom that they had learned through successes and failures themselves. I would like us to focus on a chapter in Ecclesiastes 3, and if you have your Bibles nearby, feel, nearby, feel free to turn to chapter 3 with me and we'll read the text together. It will be a familiar text to many people of faith, even if that's the only part of Ecclesiastes they have read. However, if you have found that text, let's read it together, starting from verse 1. There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and, yes, a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear, tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. The author is clear. The moment our life clock begins to tick until the day it stops and stands still, our lives are lived through a variety of seasons. They're not just lived out in life, but also before God himself. And when our time comes to an end, when our life clock stops 
and yes, it all stops for all of us, then we too will appear before God himself to give an account of how we have used our time, how we have made the most of the seasons in life and sought to honour him through every single one. So how we notice and live out these different seasons, how we embrace them, even the seasons we are uncomfortable with, matters. One observation about the text we have read together is to note that for every negative point, there is a positive one. Yes, there will be a time to uproot, but there will be a time to plant again. Yes, there's a time to give away, but there will be a time to search. And yes, in this time when we are unable to brace our friends and, and family, there will be a time where we can do that again, embracing them, hugging them. Life in the 21st century has seemed, up until recently, where we have all been pursuing the one season of being on the go. Busyness has been considered a badge of merit. Busyness has been something that we have pursued, but we like being occupied with, we can't sit down. For many, it is felt that uh, to strive for a perpetual season of work without a time to rest, a time to pause and a time to be still is something good. Hmm, I'm not sure. So when we continue to try and maintain this one long season of being busy, sometimes life enforces another season upon us so that we change the season. And when we do this, it feels at times it is uncomfortable, even unnatural. When we have not looked to embrace the different seasons in our own lives, when we try to move on ourselves or move others on without us or them properly working through that season, then we are missing out on something, missing out on something that life has to offer. Let me give some examples. When ourselves or others go through a season of grieving, there is always that helping hand who's trying to move us or others on before they are ready to help them get over it. But grief cannot be rushed. We simply do not stop grieving because life for the rest of us around continues. Grief is painful. It is hard. Grief is also part of the healing process and it cannot be hurried. So we make the most of that season. We use it, we work through it, we allow grief as something that we need to go through. Grief is not a bad thing. In fact, a quote I heard about grief says that it is a price of being able to have loved. Grief is the price we pay for being able to have loved. And the more we have loved, the more grief is hard. Another example is when we go through a season of ill health. We're always rushing to be better. We never allow, allow ourselves to heal. If we take time off of work, we go back to work before we are truly ready. If we are ill and we can work, we will just go to work, no matter if our health is impacted by that. And we get it from colleagues, people saying, oh, when are you coming back to work? As if encouragement is that we shouldn't be staying at home being sick. So these seasons and others, well, they feel a little bit uncomfortable. Having to stay where we are, to not rush around is a little foreign. And that is difficult in the season we are in. Time heals is a phrase often brought out to comfort those going through difficult seasons. But I'm not convinced that this is always true. I don't believe time on its own heals. And George Orwell, one of the giants of British literature and the author of the novel 1984, a book that introduced us to terms such as Big Brother and Double Think, says this about time, which I think is nearer to the truth, for it suggests we require more than just time to heal. He says this, they say that time heals all things. Smiles and tears across the years, they twist my heartstrings yet. 
And so the season we are in, not one that we would choose, but is being rightly imposed on us, because if we are really one nation, then we have responsibilities to the young and old and vulnerable. And those responsibilities that we are taking this thing seriously have to be made evident. This season, despite it being uncomfortable for many of us, may also be offering us some opportunities. So rather than trying to push it away or wishing it go more quickly, what if we embraced it as a time to be still? For a space to reflect, to nurture a sense of wonder and foster the attitude of appreciation. Rather than push this season away and rushing to get it through, what if this was a season for a time to be a part but in that we find space to be creative and finding ways to remain connected to the nearest and dearest and people we know and care for. But this is not space to sit back and shrink into our own individualism, for there will be those who are going through other types of season, may need seasons of difficulty, and they need us even more than ever. For those who are going through a time where you are weeping because you are mourning, we want to offer the words of Jesus to you that says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Our prayer being that may you know God's comfort in this season. For those who are experiencing loss where something has been torn from you, perhaps the words of the psalmist will help you when they say, In you, O Lord, I have my refuge. And those of you who are going for an increased sense of loneliness, Remember Jesus' words, that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Although you are lonely and you are in isolation, we do not want you to feel isolated. There's one last observation I want to offer about this text. As you read through it, as you work through and spot and identify the different seasons, I wonder if you notice that there is one season that it doesn't mention. There is nothing to mention about a season of fear. It has been left out. There is no time to be fearful. It's as if God himself is saying that in all we experience and allow to mould and shape our lives, fear is not to be one of them. A time to, well, to make the most of what we have, to give thanks for it, but also to acknowledge the author of life through all of these things, for the season we are in and the seasons we will move to. Amen. I want to invite you for a time to pray now. And this week, I would like us to pray for our local communities, wherever you are watching this from. I offer these words from Psalm 32 before we pray. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from travel and surround me with songs of deliverance. Let us pray. Eternal God and Father, in our world where the seasons are changing and we find ourselves in the middle of a time that is unfamiliar, uncomfortable and in many ways unnatural, we are reminded that your love for us is constant and you are sovereign. You are our rock and our hiding place, a safe place to seek out, knowing you will welcome us and will listen to the concerns of our hearts. We give thanks for the many acts of kindness we are witnessing in our communities, visible signs of loving our neighbour. In a world where we have seen so much ugliness, it is good to be reminded that there is much goodness out there too. We give thanks for all efforts evident in our own community of London Coney, whether they are the acts of kindness expressed through the formal channels, such as the parish council and the local police, or simply the acts of a kindness of a stranger. For our friends and family members who are in isolation, may they never feel isolated. And for our friends and family who have a heightened sense of anxiety because of this virus, may they know a way to 
see that God provides a peace beyond all understanding. And we pray for our own church family, remembering those who would be considered vulnerable. May they know that their God is their hiding place. And we pray for our friends, the two families in our church community who have a, a season of grief enforced on them. In a time when we cannot hold them ourselves, we pray that they too will know the arms of the Father around them. And in this week ahead, we acknowledge that it is Holy Week. The seven days leading up to where Jesus went to the cross and then he burst forth from the grave where hope was proclaimed and light shone even in the darkest night. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, God bless you and go in peace. Amen.